We are about ready to sort of have our, our keynote by uh, Dr. Mar Gonzalez Franco. And um, uh, so I will, uh, we'll get her online here in a second to, uh, to take over the screen. Um, Dr. Gonzalez Franco is uh, currently works at Microsoft and in the Epic group, this is the extended perception, interaction and cognition team. Uh, she's done a lot with spatial computing and from, from both the academic side, but then also a lot of industry work to kind of bring to the uh, to bring her experiences with virtual reality um, uh, uh, to the things that she does. And um, she builds lots of devices, uh, works on different experiences, and uh, is going to talk to us about some of that today uh, in uh, her talk, Impossible Outside Virtual Reality. And I hope that it inspires a lot of people uh, that work in the spatial user interaction areas of virtual reality. And with that, I will uh, let we'll bring Mar on and let her take over the screen. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to start the screen sharing. So. Okay. Um, so thank you for having me for the keynote. Um, for me, I think that the biggest challenge right now for everything that is spatial computing is to convince everyone that uh, we should move into it, right? So I, I think to do that, we, we need to show um, the industry, especially when, when we go talk to people in the industry is, uh, but I think everywhere else, even the consumer is the added value. What is different? What are the things that uh, this new technology or this new form of interaction bring to the table compared to uh, what we have now? So that's why I've been focusing on this idea. What type of things are impossible outside of virtual reality, right? Uh, and I think uh, a special user interaction, it's key to demonstrate that. So I'm very excited to be uh, today here. So we're changing paradigm, right? We're moving from this idea that the content is inside the screen um, to this idea that the user is inside the content. And once we move there, um, we will see that um, we can build systems that interface with reality very differently, okay? Uh, I'm gonna be setting up some um, interesting uh, publications on the side so people can, can follow that. So one of the first things you can do when uh, you start uh, creating systems that interface with reality is introduce content between participants and, and uh, enhance collaboration in different ways. Um, first explorations uh, with that, uh, right, include this idea that, oh, you know, can you produce these depth uh, experiences uh, with virtual objects, right? I mean, this, this was before HoloLens, but I still think that uh, video see-through technologies have a lot of potential because um, they can produce much better blended realities than uh, uh, just um, um, augmented reality as soon as we cannot have completely opaque augmented reality. So I think this type of video see-throughs are very interesting. Um, we can move into other things that include very much like system building, right? Um, flying a drone from a first person perspective um, and even augmenting the, the actual experience of the user. So what we do here is we use the camera of HoloLens to recognize the heartbeats 
uh, by uh, reducing the three main colors of, of the uh, RGB and then do si signal decomposition to, to find the heart rate. So with that, we can, and also we do uh, ballistocardiography, which is like these little movements in your head that happen re that because of your heart rate. So we are able to show your heart rate and the other person's heart rate. And then um, you're able to see that from a first person perspective, right? Um, kind of like this. So we can already enhance the type of things you can see while you are interacting with the real world. And those are the type of systems that we can build that interface with reality. And, and certainly there are much, uh, many more things that you can build from the engineering point of view. But I, I became more interested about building systems that interface between the brain and reality than just uh, the system in itself. Uh, and that requires uh, some neuroscience. So when, when we go into the brain, we have these very complex systems with uh, dynamic priors, uh, different signals arriving at different times with different resolutions. And of course, the brain needs to uh, integrate all of that. Uh, which means it's actually kind of easy to trick the brain. And I think that's why all this uh, virtual reality works really well. Um, for example, here you have two lines, A and B, they are exactly the same size, but perceptually we see it very different. We see that B is larger. And perception has evolved a lot over the, the years and, um, in, in, if we look at evolution as a whole paradigm over uh, millennia, and uh, we see that diversity in Earth only first uh, is, uh, arrived when, when um, you know, we move from single cells into animals and uh, that we're able to perceive. Because when you're able to perceive, you can. Um, perceive your prey, the uh, predator can perceive the prey, the prey can perceive the predator, then you have these needs for rapid evolution. And, and I think the, the level of perception we find on Earth, uh, you know, it, it should be a good inspiration for uh, improving what we can do in virtual reality and augmented reality and spatial computing through perception, uh, because we can create sensors that are a kind to other animals and not just the humans, right? And if we move into these uh, sensory experiences, uh, we understand that there is like sensory dominance in humans and we're very visual animals. And, and we should take into advantage that. And uh, we have done some research around it. Um, Attention is very driven by vision, and it also um, there are some effects that can be created because we we believe our vision is so good, also right, so dominant, and sometimes it's not. So we can play on that. So we we have been using eye gaze, and that again plays a bit on how many inputs we can use for for spatial computing that it's. It's completely uh, a new uh, view compared to what we can do with other technologies. So here, when we check that you are looking somewhere, we can change a piece of a puzzle. Um, we can uh, see, oh, this person likes this type of uh, paintings. Let's change all the other paintings in the gallery. And you don't even see it because you're <laughs> uh, looking somewhere else. Uh, we can change uh, haptic, uh, you know, you just have one haptic prop and two objects. We change, uh, we, we see, oh, this person seems to be liking that object. So we, we blend and change where the objects are positioned. And then when you go grab the, the haptic proxy, um, that's been changed. Um, 
And it can be used also for things like uh, reducing cost of, of certain things, like you're moving away, looking away, then we perform a low quality explosion instead of having to, to render a very high quality explosion. And we uh, explore other possible applications of this. But basically, there is this idea that you, you develop a sensory expertise and you'll get better on this sensor but also that you will need to integrate all these uh, sensory inputs. Uh, like for example, if you're using vision and tactile or vision and audio, um, it will follow a Bayesian inference uh, model in which um, the, the two modalities will merge together and the, the more modalities that say, yes, this is what I'm feeling, uh, the more you'll perceive it as reality, even if it's not. Uh, there are some experiments on this that even show that this is not just an addition, it's a super addition. Uh, this experiment with the cat and a dog and the dog that can either hear or see or hear and see. And then you can see that it's actually the, the level of activation and neuronal spikes is 150% higher when you have the, the multisensory experience. And I think that explains a little bit why virtual reality and augmented reality create these very, very impressive experiences regarding plausibility or presence compared to any other prior um, um, technology. So I've been trying to play with this blending, right? Uh, what if we have more than one sensor, for example, sight and proprioception? And, and what type of things we can do? And we can do things like measure latency on VR systems, right? Because the human has a, it, it, humans are very good at uh, rapid decision and rapid uh, task, right? Like you, you perform tasks with almost same accuracy all the time if you want. Uh, of course, different humans will have different accuracies, but uh, I think currently we're underusing the human in, in the virtual reality. And uh, you know, every VR system has a human. Why don't we use that as our latency measurement? And that that's kind of what we were exploring here. So we compare the latency measure on a metric scale with a, a millisecond accuracy clock. And, and the latency measured by a human. And we found that across different devices, those seem to be correlated and, and significantly similar. Uh, when we convert uh, sight and hearing, other types of experiments, right? Uh, things like, oh, what if you have a specialized people around you telling you commands uh, in a coordinate response measure? in which two people are saying almost the same thing uh, with different content. And then we play with lip sync, asynchronous, no lip. And in the worst condition, we were able to produce 30% errors, right? Like you were supposed to hear uh, Charlie and you would, when you're asked, what did Charlie say? Uh, you'll say blue three, right? And, and you'll be like, no, that's what Lakers said. And uh, so one task that would be very easy to do uh, can become very hard if you start playing with the, the side. And it really shows up to the, this visual dominance, even for, for audio tasks. One of the good thing about the visual dominance is that we can recalibrate, right? And, and also humans are adaptable. So when you go into things like, oh, how can I produce a spatial audio well or uh, and there is a lot of effort on, on creating personalized HRTFs, but I don't think that can go to the consumer. And I don't think it's needed because instead of calibrating the systems, many times you can calibrate the user. And um, here, for example, what we did is we produced some sound that was happening around the user, right? And they needed to localize. You see the sound is a bit annoying. So they needed to localize in a space and what we found is that later we gave different exposures of calibration. Uh, either um, you're seeing a ball and hearing the sound coming from the ball. So you're having a visual audio experience. Similar like when you go to the movies after a second or two, you recalibrate and you don't hear the sound coming from the, the 
a speaker somewhere, you, you hear the sound coming from the mouth of the actor, right? Uh, and so on. So we're very good at attaching sound to, to some visual input, like you're uh, hearing some noise, you look around, it is the, the fridge and you rapidly apply it there. So what we found is that that effect also happens in virtual reality. And then after that experience, when you're asked again to localize around you, um, you localize much better. Uh, we, uh, in the area of audio also, we can think of a lot of augmented reality because audio is a spatialized as we're seeing and is a type of a spatial computing. So we have been working with, a, you know, using that as a tool for, for navigation, uh, like, um, a, you know, um, GPS navigation to hear the sound that is coming from a specific point and you need to go there instead of hearing turn right, turn left, which uh, um, it's a very big reduction of this um, decision making for humans, right? So I think there is a, a real chance for augmentation of sensors instead of this, you know, computation just producing outputs that have replaced your decision making. Uh, I've been working also on, on sight and touch, the combination of both, and uh, created illusions that can simulate touch outside the body. So if you have two controllers and they vibrate at different amplitudes, you perceive that something touch right in the middle or like close, you know, like in, the, in different locations. Uh, we describe this uh, uncanny ballet of haptics through precisely this. Um, theory. So here, what we're seeing is um, uh, something very clear. And, and the effect of the uncanny ballet can be explained very easy. Uh, if, if you are in virtual reality and you feel a touch behind your shoulder and you turn around and there is, um, oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, maybe the sound is not playing. Um, I, I will make sure to talk on top of it. Um, so, so the effect that we were seeing there is a, a ball moving around the space. You're able to spatialize touch, which I think is something that is surprising to many people that touch is something that uh, can be felt outside of your body. But if you think of uh, how many tools you use to touch something, right, like um, a spatel or, um, and, and then you perceive the touch through that, a tool and, and you are able to know how far the touch is, you know, like a cane from a blind person. So touch is really uh, something that you can perceive outside of your body and uh, will give you this connection with, the, with whatever object you're touching, right? Because you, you can even calculate distances with the objects, uh, textures. Um, so here, one of the very big findings about the uncanny ballet of haptics is this idea that if, um, you know, if you're in virtual reality and somebody was to come and touch you on the back, if you turn around and there is no reason for that, the only reason will be like there is a person outside virtual reality. So that will break your illusion. And I feel like that's what happens when many times there are vibration on controllers or, you know, because we don't have a lot of haptics yet. Uh, that that happen and and create this 
they bring you out of virtual reality. So we have to be very careful with haptics in that sense that if they are not coordinated with the rest of the spatial experience, they actually act like a break of illusions. And here we, are, we created some uh, general piece pub, uh, publication too. And uh, I've been working more on haptics, uh, creating devices, right? Um, because, wow, controllers are so limited right now. If you want to do something like that with a, a virtual object, it's almost impossible. So uh, here we show torque. Uh, this one is actually a very interesting device because we create all of that through illusions uh, because it's a rigid controller. But still, it gives you this uh, dexterity that you're moving something between the fingers of your hand. And a bit more about how it is implemented. Um, you can have a, quite a lot of control over objects. And then you know, we can measure how much you're pressuring to control the hand and thus the, the object that is in front of you. And we can play different textures to sort of simulate how much pressure you are perceiving uh, for the properties of the object, right? Like a compliant object or, or a very rigid object. Uh, other options are more like a cloud, um, you know, like a thong type of devices that you can break when you want or you can apply some compliance. Uh, this one is very interesting because it has a very tiny motor. So we're using sort of your own force against you uh, to stop you, right? Uh, it feels, uh, it's a bit like a boat with a capstan and then a clutch, which is here, uh, that creates that uh, small energy uh, storage. And also other devices that will provide this experience of touching especially and, and objects around you, like uh, a, the haptic pivot we just presented in, in Juist uh, last week. And the idea here is that if you coordinate uh, the physics of the game engine with the, with the particular controllers, you can just make it arrive on demand to your hand whenever you need it. So those are all things that augment our spatial experience, but uh, not necessarily are impossible in reality, right? They are things that we are already sort of doing some of them in reality. We're transferring them to virtual reality. Something that is impossible in reality is to get inside a virtual body and maybe have a super gigantic body or, you know, all these experiences with the, uh, virtual bodies are completely unheard of in, in, in reality many times. And we're able to do this because, you know, there are all these delusions that we can produce on the perceptual system because uh, of what we were saying before, um, the, the multisensory integration having all these sort of play arounds. So one of the first experiences or experiments on a body uh, um, modifications and is the rubber hand illusion. It's a, it's a bodily illusion in which your hand is hidden behind a curtain, you place a rubber hand in front of you, and then there is some visual tactile or, uh, you know, it has been shown there are many other ways to stimulate this, but visual tactile is kind of like, the most common one. If the visotactile stimulation is synchronous, uh, which in VR means that if you have very good tracking system, then you have visual proprioceptive or visual motor correlations. Uh, and then that creates that, that illusion and, and you will respond like if it was your hand for many of the interactions. So once you go into VR, you look down and you have a virtual body. The first thing is that that creates an embodiment illusion. Um, that embodiment illusion will uh, allow you to perceive, oh, my body has been substituted and I have agency over it and I own it. And, you know, this, this, completely, this complete experience. Um, one of the things that happens with embodiment is that it alters uh, things like motor behavior uh, in different ways. And uh, we explore that on the self-avatar follower effect. 
so there are, uh, you know, things like if, if the avatar looks like this, I will behave like the avatar, right? Like this mimicry effect. But there are also um, much more things like you want to be in match with where the avatar is, even if, if you're not told to do so. So here you can see a person who is being drift, uh, has no need to perform the task. Um, so the, the person could continue having the hand up and performing the task up here. But because the avatar is drifting, the person feels the urge to drift. And they have been trained to, you don't need to drift, right? Like, but the person here decides they, they want to drift even when it's a very instantaneous move. And we see that all the time, right? Like people enter virtual reality and the avatar is kind of uh, static and they would try to fit inside the avatar and stay there. Uh, so um, that is kind of a magnetic effect. And I, I, uh, I think it's very interesting for many purposes, the, including rehabilitation, this idea that you want to match your avatar. Uh, when we go further into how this embodiment pro is produced, uh, we can see that there are these three major things. One is this sense of embodiment, uh, of body ownership. That is my body, because mainly because I'm controlling it. Um, you can enhance that experience by adding mirrors into virtual reality. I think once we have a very much wider field of view, maybe mirrors will not be necessary. But we really need to cover all the peripheral because currently I only see my body through very much the peripheral. Uh, then things like, oh, you know, something that was very striking to me is like, are people responding to the questionnaire <laughs> something, but are they feeling that? And to which level is it subconscious feeling? So I started doing a lot of EG recording and um, for example, seeing whether if I attack your hand, would you have an EEG response similar to if you were threatened in real life? And I asked people, do not move your hand, right? Like I don't want you to move your hand and still measure a strong uh, um, alpha rhythm desynchronizations and a readiness potential, uh, which is the difference between uh, the two hemispheres and it's um, completely subconscious activity that happens before you start a movement, right? So there is this triggering in, in only when you, you're attacking the hand and not when you're attacking the table. Another experiment we did is asking people to follow uh, a, a particular arrow in the center. And then we saw that uh, people would drift uh, or you know, people would make mistakes, but also we were able to introduce mistakes. So you were going in the right direction, but we throw the avatar in the other direction. So, and uh, the interesting thing is we use, we, we just flipped your movement. So it's your speed, is uh, you're controlling that movement. It's just in the other direction. So we do this Ericsson flanker task of, of the arrows and you're following the, the arrows. And every 20 trials, there will be an incongruent trial. I'll show you now. So you saw the person moving in the other direction. Uh, what happens there is that apart from your own errors, right, which happen when you are making a mistake and you see this negative voltage on the frontal cortex, there is another negative voltage much later, around 400 milliseconds in the parietal side of the brain. And that, that uh, shows that um, it's an integration area, right? It's a visual proprioceptive integration that you're saying, okay, that, that information did came wrong. Um, and so it fits into the error monitoring models and motor control and, uh, you know, even a schizophrenic type of uh, um, pathologies present similar experiences, but this was, uh, I think, the first time that was shown on, on healthy humans. So the interesting thing is that after working so much on electrophysiology, what I find consistently is that it correlates very nicely with the questionnaires. <laughs> so I think we're safe to do questionnaires for body ownership and embodiment. 
And that's partially because I, I went through all that process that I thought, okay, we, it's very important that we start having a standardized questionnaires. And together with Tabitha Peck, uh, professor in Davidson College, we put together this questionnaire and we have a new version with the smaller questions that we have validated with 400 uh, questionnaires already taken from experiments. And it will come out very soon. Um, so, and it will have a bit reduced its question, so it will be even better. Um, then the things that you can do when you have avatars, right? Like you can change size, gender, shape, uh, how, you, how fast you walk, uh, you know, you can be a giant and that alters your locomotion. Um, you can be a, inside a robot, right? Uh, it's, it doesn't need to be just um, uh, a particular uh, avatar. It can be a robot that you embody. And uh, all of these things are so interesting. And then there are effects of having avatars, like you perceive that much better. You, uh, you know, there are even studies on spatial cognition that show that if you have an avatar, it's much easier to do mental memory. Uh, but Anthony did, and okay, sorry. Um, so, so we wanna um, kind of. I think there is still a lot to be learned about this, and I think it's very lacking that in virtual reality right now you still enter and you don't have a body. So I'm trying to change that in different ways, and I've seen also that embodiment, the high embodied people do not suffer distant compression so much, right? Like uh, here we can see that low embodied people are having much uh, more distance compression, which is something that is very well known. You enter in VR and uh, things appear closer to you. And, and that's, uh, you know, um, Vicky Iterante has done many experiments on this and many other people, right? So it's very well known, this distance compression. But if you're well embodied, it doesn't. And, and that makes sense, right? Like we measure the world in based of our body. Like I know how big this uh, cup of water is because I compare it to my hand. So I would know, oh, this is a very big one, right? Like I, uh, you always compare to your body. So in virtual reality, it's a similar experience. Um, finally, you know, there is this thing, what about avatars looking like you or not? And that is important too. And I, I've been working on that a little bit too and trying to generate avatars that look like you and what happens and do does your brain interpret it like you? And uh, what we find is this, uh, you know, this uh, dotted line is the response on your visual cortex to self images. And in here we can see that it's not as low in power. There is not such a, a, a depression, but um, it is also reduced significantly reduced when you're presented an avatar, an avatar, and that also correlates with this idea that oh, does the avatar look like you? So it, it is subjective to a way, or like the unconscious and the sub, and the conscious, uh, I find oftentimes are very well correlated. And then the other thing we find is that over time, it looks more and more like you, right? Like the difference between the virtual and the, the real uh, is very small. And I remember trying a spatial, I don't know if you've tried the, the spatial uh, platform and you can go and build this avatar that is, is not super great, but it feels great. I, I thought, so I thought, that, oh, I look like Angela Merkel. But then I was like, oh, it's not that bad, right? Like at first I, I, I love her, she's doing great. And, um, but then you, you see there are a few things that work really nice and they had nothing to do with the lookalike. It had more to do with how alive it is. It has these idling animations. So I work a bit on idling animation. And here you can see, um, two avatars, the one on the right has some idling animation and the difference is very clear. And when you're inside that body, this one seems alive and this one seems completely dead. So I think facial animations are becoming very important. Uh, we do a task in which we ask people to, uh, after that experience, to do a morphing task and just press a space whenever this 
morphine doesn't look like you anymore or in the other direction looks like you. And what we find is there is an hysteresis, of course, it doesn't like the, the direction in which you are doing the task matters. And um, the hysteresis is smaller when you're having that uh, idle animation, right? Uh, it means that it's harder to distinguish what is you and what is the avatar. Uh, it also affects very much where people are looking uh, regarding the face. Lip sync alone already makes a big difference. Uh, people really want to look much more at the face than any other part. And I think for, for video communication, it's clear that you want to have uh, people looking at the face, right? Uh, I think it's, it, people even avoid looking at the face to those avatars that are non-expressive. And that brings me to the last part of the talk, which is avatar behavior, right? Like perception drives behavior. However we perceive life, we're going to change how we behave around it. And um, in VR, perception is, is key, right, to the behavior. And uh, this idea that once you enter VR, you have this place illusion that you're there, this possibility illusion that the things that are happening are real, and all together creates that present illusion. And there is this experiment, very famous, um, that um, um, from Seagraph 2002, that a person is asked to walk to the edge of a cliff and then <laughs> go to the other side of a room. And they know there is no real cliff, but nobody crosses the cliff. And uh, they, they have this very high heart rate experience. And so uh, it's very different from a virtual, uh, you know, just on the, on the screen. Um, so I've been working a little bit on the behavioral side and uh, work with the avatars and reproduce the Milgram uh, uh, obedience to authority experiment, but we made it a bit more complicated. We were asking people to to shock, electroshock the avatar, which we know from previous studies that people will do it uh, similar to, to how it was done in reality, um, which is interesting. It's not like they try to uh, shock the avatar more than people would shock a person. It's kind of uh, similar. And um, but the interesting thing is here, we try to measure if people would cheat, right? And, and what that would trigger. And what we find is that uh, when we, this is inside a cave, right? So you can see this is for both eyes, uh, stereoscopic. And you're asked to read a series of uh, words and then the person, the, the avatar needs to reply. If it's wrong, the person shocks with an electric machine. So we measured the voice uh, and we are able to see that uh, the more people help, the better they get away with uh, electroshocking. It's sort of like, I'm already trying to help you. And if you're not doing it well, it's not my fault uh, situation. And it's kind of interesting because uh, it sort of explains a lot uh, uh, how people get away with uh, doing very, very bad things. Uh, uh, for example, during the Second World War, um, you know, and the Holocaust. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting read. And also the Scientific American piece, it's, it summarizes very nice too. Uh, but basically it shows that, you know, avatars are more important than ever. I talked to Emily Reynolds already four years ago. Wow. And we were saying, okay, we need to have more avatars in virtual reality, right? Like uh, uh, they're, they're the social areas, you know, like all space or, uh, and there you, you have avatars, which are also not fantastic, but at least they're avatars. But everywhere else you enter, you, maybe you have some hands, right? And, and that doesn't seem to, to be very representative. So I've been trying to change that. And so I open source the Microsoft Rocketbox uh, avatar library, which is over a hundred avatars that can be used for, for VR. They are high quality. Um, they can uh, be animated very nice because they're rigged. Um, and I initially open source it for a, only academic and research use, but we're gonna change that now under MIT license. So, you know, everybody can use it. 
uh, and there, there is a co accompanying paper that explains more about how avatars are produced and the different ways to produce avatars that I think are it's going to be very informative uh, for people. And also particular things about the rocket box avatars are kind of explained in that paper. And then more things, right? Because if you just have the avatars, you <laughs> Uh, many people are not going to be able to use them unless they are computer scientists. So we have been creating a, a new uh, libraries that will allow for more like toolboxes that run on top of the rocket box that will allow you to create this type of animations just from uh, depth sensing camera. And so we create this kind of move box. Uh, it's a capture studio that will be released very soon before December because um, and will be presented in AIVR. And so here you can see a person is just in their home recording their own animations and playing them back. And uh, the whole system can also do lip sync. Uh, it can do blinking, uh, you know, very simple uh, facial animations and uh, finger tracking. If you have Quest is in there, we have uh, one of the projects in there um, has a inverse kinematics. So, you know, it's like it can produce this embodiment illusion. And then the last part of the, the project uh, includes um, a, a version of the Vive uh, um, technology that um, was released by Max Planck. Uh, that uh, interfaces with the rocket box avatars, which basically means if you have archival footage of videos, you can retrieve the forms and um, put them back inside VR. I can imagine people like using body cams from um, police officers and recreating a scenes inside VR. And I think that opens much more the use of VR for uh, non-computer scientists, even like uh, sociologists or people trying to study bystander effect or et cetera, right? So I'm trying to have more people use avatars all along. And I wanna thank all of my collaborators and, and co-workers at Microsoft Research and visitors, interns, et cetera. And uh, I'm ready for questions now. Excellent. Thank you, Mar, for that. That was a really very interesting keynote. I, I found it fascinating. Um, we have some questions in the um, uh, q and A. I don't know if you can see that. And also, I want to thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for getting up a little earlier, maybe, than you <laughs> normally might. Yeah. Uh, it's it's early here, but not that anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I can pull out the Q and A. Or do you want to moderate it? Or uh, you can. I think you can. It might be. Uh, well, I can ask the question for everyone so they can hear it. And okay. Can... So, uh, Ihan uh, Sakar Sakaria, I hope I pronounced your name. Hopefully, not too bad. Uh, what do you think about the degree of realism when using hand tracking in VR? Do you think a more realistic hand will improve immersion a lot, or is there a limit? Well, I think uh, with every sensor, and that's partially what we found with the Uncanny Ballet, is that no matter what sensory uh, part you're trying to uh, stimulate, you can run into the Uncanny Ballet. And I think with the hand, uh, it also happens. Right, uh, but I I think it's amazing the type of quality that we have now with hand tracking with MRTK or with the Oculus Quest. It is uh, uncomparable until now, and I think that's great. Uh, I'm just looking forward to have more of the body, and I think actually there are some experiments that show that you don't need ex you know a spectacular quality uh, for people to fill in the gap. Right. Um, so, so just that it works, it's pretty good already, but I think uh, it currently works very nicely. And as I said, because of the follower effect and everything, you're, you're going to try to, to match. And if you read the follower effect paper, uh, there is this effect that um, even if you're not completely in match, your brain will try to think that you are in match, right? So uh, it is trying to avoid these semantic violations that we saw, for example, on this very dramatic 
a hand motion in the, in the opposite direction that we did with the anarchic hand uh, agency, right? That, that's, that's so dramatic that it really breaks and creates that uh, uh, negative 400 ex, um, uh, potential on the uh, parietal cortex. But I don't think that happens normally in VR. In normal in VR, your, your brain uses top-down mechanisms to sort of override whatever sensory input doesn't like or doesn't feed the predictions, right? And, and that is very good news for a small errors on tracking or uh, you know, things that are not very dramatic. And for hand tracking, that, that's clearly uh, very good news. Excellent, thank you. Um, the same, uh, question by the same person, Ayan. Uh, what are your thoughts on adding arms, shoulders, elbows, to an avatar in VR and control them via in inverse kinematics when hand tracking is enabled? I think that is the way to go for the time being. I mean, as you see, I, I am proposing also using uh, deep sensing, external deep sensing like the Azure Kinect or Kinect or others, right? Uh, even currently with the, the open pose, uh, it's getting better. Um, it, it's more accessible even with webcams. Uh, but the, the whole idea there is that if you can track the whole body, it's great. But if not, inverse kinematics does an amazing job. And most of the experiments I've done with whole body experiences are based on inverse kinematics, uh, especially for, for the arms, right? Like you're just, I mean, you can have errors on the elbow, but how you know you, you often don't move the shoulder so much so you're only solving for the elbow in terms of like the the, the equation and i don't think we, we pay attention so much to the elbow unless you're doing a task with the elbow and then you really don't want to use inverse kinematics yeah they had a follow-up on that I just and you kind of answered it right because like they wondered if uh the impact of using of the impact on immersion, really, uh, because the brain might detect uh, the incorrect movements on some of these joints or some of these. Uh... Yeah, as I say, like uh, from my uh, experience on, on motor control, uh, if you're having a very dramatic, uh, you know, alteration to your intent, uh, but do you intend to move the elbow in a particular way? Or are you also doing some sort of inverse kinematics in your brain to decide where the elbow goes? Because I, I feel like you are targeting where the hand goes and that is your intent. But you're, the, the, the rest of the inverse kinematic chain in your own body is something that happens autonomously and you're not obviously thinking about it. So I, I think any sort of uh, discordance in, in whatever the virtual body is doing and you're doing, it's gonna be first minimal because there are not that many options that, you know, like if you were to do this and the elbow bend it in completely the other direction, right? Like um, that would be horrible uh, for, for embodiment, but I don't think that happens normally in, in inverse kinematics. There, there is like these very tiny errors and those are very fine for the brain to, to fill the gap in. Excellent, thank you. I, I have a, a question real quick while we're waiting. So uh, anyone uh, listening, please make sure you uh, type in your question to the Q&A and then we'll uh, um, be able to ask it here. In a, in yeah, a maybe there is some question on Discord. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully the other chairs are monitoring Discord and we'll kind of get that over for me. Uh, one question I have, you brought up a really great point with the rocket box uh, work, it, making it accessible, right, outside mm -hmm. of computer science. I think um, it's it's always kind of, uh, it's very interesting that we can do all this, right, if you have not a program and you can work on these um, devices and this equipment. But there's so many other people uh, that could kind of start delving into this and doing things, right? And so um, I guess, what are your, what are your experiences on, on or have you had with making VR more participatory, right? So, yeah, I, I think this is critical, right? We're we're uh, moving into a phase that uh, we need more people, 
I'm trying to convince people that you know we we need to move into spatial computing and we need to to do more spatial interaction, but we don't even know what a website looks when you are in a spatial computing. Mm -hmm. So we we have this very little knowledge about many things that need to be rethought completely, and we don't know what the mouse looks like in VR, right? Like. If, if the controllers that we're using, they keep changing in every iteration, every, con, every pro, um, you know, manufacturer changes the controller every time. And luckily to add more things, right? But um, uh, less is more sometimes. <laughs> or, and you look on the other hand, the mouse and the mouse hasn't changed in 30 years. So I think we're still to find um, even some people still think that you need to use bare hands so we are on that the spectrum of disagreement. And I think the more people we bring in to the discussion, the better. I think it would also be very arrogant to try to produce the solution from industry for everyone. I think everyone will produce their own solution a little bit and then something will prevail. Um, and in that regard, I think, instead of producing a solution, producing tools that other people can uh, use to, to create solutions, I think it's a good approach. And I really like the open sourcing experience so far. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, it impacts science much more. It's kind of hard to, to publish some of the, the work, right? In the, because people will be like, oh yeah, but this is an engineering paper. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, but it's going to change the whole science of the, you know, maybe a significant percentage of experiments on avatars next year are going to be done with our avatars and tools. And, and I think that it's already a quite nice uh, uh, scientific impact. So I, I'm also trying to advocate, like at the beginning of the talk, I'm talking about these systems uh that you can build and i think the systems even if they are not they are in, in in themselves very interesting right and i think now that we're going through COVID, it's very hard to run user studies i think uh, running and creating systems is uh, it's the natural uh, transition Excellent. Any, uh, any other questions real quick? We have a little bit of time for some more. So if you've got them, please ask the questions. Um, well, um, any other chairs want to chime in with a question, you feel free or any of the panelists up here. Um, the one, I have another question I guess I'll ask. Um, the, the, the devices I find really interesting because I think mm -hmm. we've been, we've had controllers and we have to use those controllers to do whatever set of tasks, right? So there's kind of a limit on the affordances they allow in my mind, right? And so um, do you, and I, I guess the question I have is, you know, in some future system where we're incorporating all of these things, are there, is there like a wall of controllers or devices that, you know, that highlight themselves as needed, you know, yeah. and you reach out and grab, and now you have the affordances or the correct abilities to interact um, with that small little thing you're now holding, like your example of the, the, the apples, right? That's a special yeah. that would help you with some of those certain things. So uh, we have been, the way we have been developing these controllers, and I, I want to explain two of the thinkings, and, and there will be m more papers coming on, on this, right? One is uh, this idea that we're not trying to simulate the hand, we're trying to simulate the properties of the objects. And that changes completely the, the paradigm, right? Instead of going through gloves, which are also, I, I as a position paper here, I don't think gloves are the solution because um, you know you need to have these very different sizes. They get dirty. Even you, you yourself wouldn't put your own glove after two hours of wearing it. And so I think uh, that, that we should be aware of that. Uh, there is a niche for gloves on very, very expensive manufacturing applications or like robot control for, you know, I, I think that still is a glove market, but I don't think the consumer is a glove market. So that is why we're very much focusing on controllers. And, and the controllers and the variety you're seeing, uh, it's very much inspired by these hand object interaction and we're preparing a taxonomy there uh, that uh, these are the you know there are things like touch grasp and physics 
right? Like these three main areas and the physics are more like physics of uh, that are applied to the object. Uh, for example, with the grasp apple thing, you can also feel things like inertia or impact, right? Like you can make it come much faster to you. So you're like grabbing things that are moving towards you. So the, you're adding physics into it. You can uh, simulate gravity with it. Um, so I think the fact that they also we're trying to produce controllers that solve each of the things instead of you know this universal controller, mm -hmm. it's giving us more freedom to explore explore implementations. And even for this idea of compliance, we found two very different implementations, one which is like a thong and the other one which is even a rigid object and just illusory experience with uh, voice coil actuators. So I think, uh, you know, it's it's sort of interesting to, to describe which are the properties that you want to, of the hand object interaction that, that you want to implement, and then different types of implementation. And, uh, um, and uh, I think that has been our methodology of exploring that area. Um, and, you know, it's very different to this, we want to replicate the hand, because I don't think you need to replicate the hand. Excellent. Okay, so we have one question that we'll take before our break real quick. And um, so Wen Ji Zhang says, thank you for the great talk. I am interested when the time that spatial computing is everywhere. How long do you expect people would spend in VR per day? Is there some substantial negative impact on that? And how could we improve? For example, for people are, people are more sensitive to simulation sickness um, for people that are, is there a way to extend their VR usage time? Yeah, this is a super interesting question that hits two questions, I think. Uh, the first one is how long until everybody has it? I think there will be a transition period in which we, I think also there is a need to find interactions that uh, interface between low immersive and high immersive setups within uh, non-spatial and spatial setups. Uh, which also brings the people who are not spatial to spatial, right? Like you can interact in alt space, even if you are on your uh, desktop. And I think that will also help bridge the gap. Um, currently, I think VR is not very prepared for multitasking, uh, which is something we do all the time, right? Like. Uh, uh, even on, on the computer, you're seeing your email, what you're writing this thing, and at the same time navigating on the internet. I don't think that's happening in VR. Or So it sort of feels like there is a need for operating system there. Um, and then uh, to the second question on, on how long will people spend in VR. I think uh, if you look at the hours a day, um, you have 24 hours, some of that you sleep, some of that you work, some of that you eat, and then, yeah, maybe you can take two hours for entertainment. I think VR falls on entertainment. And I think the biggest win for spatial computing is actually in AR, because that you can carry on your normal activity and, and have AR on top of it. Uh, but the good news is I think many of the things that we explore in VR are transferable to AR, right? So uh, I think VR is a cheaper technology right now. So I feel it can arrive to the masses sooner. Um, and the only exception for what I just said is if you, you, you think of the HMD as a screen, and then you think that as a portable screen, and then you can just get rid of your laptop right, and you work inside the HMD. Um, and it's just that you use it for higher real estate, you have, it's like you have more, more screens around you. Um, in that case, yes, you can have VR for work, which is eight hours a day, uh, additional eight hours, but it's not like you're going to be playing. And I don't think you have motion sickness in that scenario. Um, but yes, motion sickness is also an important area. I think motion sickness is very uh, related to locomotion. And I think locomotion is very underexplored. I, I even think on from the scientific point of view, uh, we're not 
doing as well on locomotion as compared to industry, right? Like every game you play Alex and they have three different types of locomotion. Like they're locomotion techniques that have never been explored from the scientific point of view and they are being used by you know, thousands of people in, in particular games. And you would be surprised how many locomotion techniques there are. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mar. Uh, that was a, a really outstanding keynote. I very much appreciate it. A um, lot thank of things you. to think about. And um, so thankful that you uh, have been able to give the keynote to uh, this group. So thank you. And if we could applaud, that would be really one nice experience <laughs> with your Zoom really way. Okay, um, thank you so much.